Welcome to Global Talks by Paw of Life, a podcast about redefining healthcare through a global perspective, allowing you to become informed and involved. In each episode, we deliver the best hard-hitting analysis and discussion of what is currently impacting the healthcare landscape with guests from a variety of industries. Now, here's your host, Pavan Lohia. Welcome back and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Global Talks by Pav Life. I'm your host, Pavan Lohia, and I hope you're all doing well during this time. Today, we're going to be taking a deeper dive into the role that public health has played in this COVID-19 pandemic, both here in the United States and across the globe. With my guest today, we'll be taking a deeper dive on a variety of issues that include coronavirus testing, the shortages of personal protective equipment, all the way to the public health preparedness, both here in the United States and across the world. My special guest today is Bernadette Bowden-Albella. She is the former Senior Associate Dean of Research and Program Development from the NYU College of Global Public Health. And now she currently serves as the Director and Founding Dean of the soon-to-be School of Population and public health at the University of California, Irvine. Now it's time to introduce our special guest, Dean Bernadette. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the show. How are you doing and how are things on your end? Thank you so much for having me here. How are things at my end? Uh, Crazy, chaotic. I'm sure that anybody like you, everybody who's doing public health is uh, finding this to be you know, a difficult time, um, but an interesting time in terms of disease um, and really putting everything we have learned uh, about public health into play. So. Right. So I know uh, you're actually originally an East Coaster. Um, Currently, I'm out here in uh, New York and D.C. myself, and it's been quite interesting to see how COVID-19 started off. on, in China and how it's kind of expanded out uh, through the entire United States and around the country. So your experience as uh, a professor, now a, a leader at the UC Irvine School of Public Health, how has that kind of shaped your perception on COVID-19? Um, well, so I should just say that, yes, I'm a, a native New Yorker and in fact never left New York until I was, uh, you know, recruited out here to to be the founding dean. Um, It's interesting. So, you know, I think about, um, oh, a couple of things have happened, which I think are interesting. One is I just think about um, pandemics or or even epidemics and thinking about in my lifetime and how, how I compare them in a way to what um, what's going on now and how I think in some ways they've prepared me. So I would say, you know, the first, my first kind of encounter with uh, an epidemic was actually HIV AIDS. And that I was, I was doing basic research, not in public health at that time. Mm. I was married and, and, and very pregnant and uh, doing radioactive isotope work. And so environmental health came and said, you can't do this anymore. I was a student at the time. So right. you need to go and find something else to do. We'll pay you. But And uh, so that's how I ended up really in public health was that what what the area that I, that sort of I, I, I was needed in and that was a good fit was actually HIV, which at that time was HTLV3. So this is really uh, dating me. And I was at um, Albert Einstein College of Medicine working with somebody in pediatric AIDS. And so, you know, nobody knew. And I think that's one of the things that, I, that that's very familiar about COVID is being part of the let's call it unveiling of the disease. And so nobody kind of knew how HIV was transmitted really early on. Um, You know, were they at risk? And I remember working with allergy immunology, pediatric folks, because they were the ones that were seeing these HIV, uh, these children who were HIV positive. And their training had really been, they thought they were just going to be doing, you know, asthma and uh, other kinds of immunology. And there's this, unknown virus that's really uh, devastating to children, oftentimes 
at least one, if not both their parents might have been dead or dying. And, um, wow. and so again, the whole, and, and everything comes up. So I think that's really important thinking about, so everything, housing comes up, stigma comes up, disease transmission comes up, legal rights and responsibilities, right? So, sure, you know, sure. we all looked at China and COVID initially and said, how could they be so harsh? How could they just close down places? Um, interestingly, I came to um, to UCI in July, and uh, you know, one of the things I really wanted to contribute to as a faculty member was to teaching. And so, right. one of the one of the courses that I was really um, interested in had done a lot of teaching before was in um, infectious disease epidemiology. And Meredith Meredith, uh, you know, Fox Ozor. Uh, alumni person knows this story, but um, so I start to teach uh, infectious disease epidemiology winter quarter first week, oh, wow. um, and um, you know there there's like one little paragraph in the New York Times that starts talking about strange viruses, um, a, a strange virus in China. And I said to the 130 undergraduates, you want extra credit, let's, yeah. let's start talking about this. And to think that that one paragraph, right, has led us to basically sheltering in place in almost every state um, in the country and in countries around the world in, in a very short period of time is just, it's, it's staggering. Um, what, one thing that I think I've uh, really learned quickly in this position is that it's really important, not only one, does public health need to be the leader in thinking through all the sort of complexities of COVID, but that I really needed to take a major leadership role on this in Orange County and um, at UCI. Of course. And I think you bring up a lot of great points, uh, especially on demographics um, and your personal experience um, over the years. Um, just on demographics briefly, um, I know both of us being on the West Coast and East Coast are experiencing different waves of the right. coronavirus, right? right? So recently we've seen the reports of how it's kind of growing in the Southern and Midwestern parts of the United States. And I know, Obviously, being on either sides of the coast, um, being close to, close to or in these urban areas, um, we have access to resources. I mean, here in New York City, we have you know dozens of hospitals that are fully equipped. Um, Cal uh, California, other parts of the West Coast, you know, they have access to these resources. But you know, we have states that uh, don't even have uh, hospitals for uh, several hundred miles, and um, that's a even looking apart from that, you may not even have an ICU for several thousand miles um, if even if it's a fully functioning ICU. And so now that you are um, at UC Irvine, um, I had spoken to Dr. Chang, the student medical director there um, wow. se several weeks ago um, about how he had kind of dealt with the outbreak and uh, that response from the UC health side. So I'm curious on for students, I think they're particularly been affected um, with how to deal with this, uh, returning home, transitioning to online education. Okay. Um, was the, do you think this is something that we should have been prepared for in general or what kind of impact on education would that really be having going forward? I, we have fall, I, I know the rest of the uh, winter uh, and spring quarter was transitioned online, but going into fall and even 2021, it, there seems to be quite some uncertainty, Not, I think all across the United States, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you've asked me, you, you've got <laughs> so many questions. <laughs> yeah, that. it's, uh, yeah it, but that's okay. Let me try to, let's try to deal with the last one first. Of and then course. We'll, and then we'll go back, because I do want to talk about um, differences uh, in the experience of COVID by geography. Right. Um, but first, you know, so... Um, 
I, I speak with a lot of my um, fellow deans of programs and schools of public health. We have actually a great conversation now organized by ASPPH once a week. Um, and, um, you know, we're all grappling with the with these issues of remote versus online versus hybrid versus in person. And one of the things, though, that we all feel is that, you know, um, we we we've become a little, we became a little complacent in public health um, everywhere. Yeah. And, but in public health, you know, we, we moved so far to thinking about chronic disease. And of course that plays a huge role in here, right. but that we, that we sort of forgot that emerging infectious diseases will continue. And I think that there was this sense, well, they'll continue over there, right? right. So, you know, we, we, there was some initial panic about Ebola, but it was over there and not here. And right, so, significantly reduced. You know, that, that was okay. But, but a couple of things in education, first on public health, we have to prepare our students at the undergraduate level and at the graduate level Level, to be part of the response. Okay. Um, like other schools of public health, we have to make sure that we have a curriculum that trains our students to do things like contact tracing, that, uh, that you know, risk management, preparedness to understand what that means, and what, at whatever level those students are engaging in a public health education, that we really need to set um, and define a role for them. So it's my opinion that public health students uh, should be learning contact tracing and working as contact tracers or supervisors of contact tracers, um, and that this is going to be a huge need um, that all the governors, and that's the only way that we're really going to be able to handle COVID-19 going forward if we want to, if we want to get out of our houses, right? right. Um, and so, so the first thing is public health education. We have to make sure that it's as skills-based as it can be, skills-based not only to chronic, but also to infectious disease. We have to anticipate that with global travel and the world being now as small as it is, that we can't uh, look the other way while other folks in other countries are experiencing whatever the disease is because it's an it's a it's a plane right away um, and so we need to we need to be prepared. Absolutely, uh, it's tough. The decision that that the chancellor made here at UCI and the decision that other schools made first, it was an abrupt decision based upon this escalating number of cases and not wanting to be surging, if you will, at, at a time when students were in, you know, in um, on campus um, and yeah. go remote. So what happened with most of these schools, right, is that we went from in class to remote. And for us, it was actually remote ex exams for winter quarter was the first thing. And then we moved right. to sort of a remote quarter. And now, and so, you know, not everybody, so there's problems staying at home, right? I yeah. mean, obviously we have cabin fever, right? But serious problems, you know, um, anxiety and okay. depression. Um, we can't assume that everybody's home environments are equal. Um, there, you know, some some people are unfortunately, um, you know, um, they, they're living in households where there's domestic abuse, um, they're living in households where there isn't enough food to go around. Right. Um, they're living in households where there are other people that um, that have other needs, um, of or, or and some people aren't living in households. There are, you know, that there are people that are homeless, and right. so or lack the basic technology and, and even and, and internet and connection. Basic technology, right? And so, so it was hard to do for a, a an exam week. Harder yeah. to do for a remote. Quarter, um, but to continue this for some people is going to be, you know, not tenable. And, and so what we're really trying to do, and public health is part of the conversation, is think throughout the country how we get ourselves back to some semblance of normality within a global pandemic. I'm sure every time you say global pandemic, you think, oh my gosh, is this really <laughs> happening? Um, and yes, it is. And it's, you know, no more zombie movies, right? This yeah. is real. Um, and, um, 
And so, you know, I think that uh, the conversations, though, I just to give you a sense of what they are, I think schools want to have students back on campus to the extent that they can, because that whole campus experience, the right. campus community is very hard to get from uh, a remote or online um, platform. Or a um, Zoom call. Or Zoom call. But one of the problems is that the, the balance is that if we bring students onto campus, and I think most people will, they won't bring the full complement of students, right? Because we still need to be masked, social distancing, uh, not hanging out in groups. So how do we do that? Um, but people will get sick. Right. It's clear that, and I know the, the good news is that it looks like, for the most part, uh, the large majority of young students, uh, college age students, seem to be asymptomatic or have mild symptoms. That's not to say that some have not had severe symptoms, gone to be hospitalized, been in an ICU, been ventilated, right. or even died. Not saying that, but the overwhelming majority seem to have been you know, asymptomatic or mild. The problem is not for those students, but for everybody around them that is not, that has no immunity. And, right. and so how do you interact with faculty members or staff that have, that are at high risk, right? So, that, so what we want to try to do is keep that social distancing, offer, I think both, this is what I think where most colleges and universities are going to end up, keeping the social distancing, having a hybrid. So some people will be remote. We'll, we decrease the density on campus. Some people will be in person and dormitories will be changed so that each person has their own room. There's limited number of people sharing bathroom space. Um, you know, I could envision cafeterias being, or eating places being pick up and yeah. taken out as, as they are now. Um, so that's just kind of an overview. Yeah, and I, I think just, to, I mean, it's a very complex decision. I think being, being the UC system, having close to 700,000 right. students, uh, uh, being president at the CUNY School of Public Health and all of our 25 campuses, we also have 500,000 students spread across, spread across all of New York State um, throughout the five boroughs of Manhattan and I would say throughout the tri-state tri region itself. So it, it is tough uh, between all the administrators, um, finding out what the needs of the students are and whatnot. It's, I think it's a constantly evolving situation and, you know, kind of take it how it comes as well, right? To some degree. Right. Um, and then, yeah, um, just on demographics like I touched earlier, um, is that a cause for concern as we start to see some of these southern states and midwestern states actually reopen for business in some cases as of last week actually yeah so so here's what's going to happen right where every we don't know exactly we don't know the exact quantitative impact of any of these loosening social policies but we do really believe based upon the transmission that um these social policies will impact, right? And so yeah. right now, for example, California's done a, done really amazingly well. Um, I think one of the one of the reasons is Orange County, for example, went into a shelter in place order really early, really right. early, where there wasn't even yet a doubling every three days, which is kind of this exponential curve that other places like New York New York saw. So, um, but as we loosen up, the transmission increases. Okay, right. and um, and so the. So what, what that means is that you have more folks in communities that are circulating, whether it's asymptomatic, mild, or, or, or real onset of symptoms circulating, and you, your probability of getting sick is greater. And to your point, you know, um, in places where, there, where ICU units are, are not for several hundred miles, um, people with severe disease could die. Yeah. Um, and, and at a greater rate than in a place where, you know, every couple of miles there's a, a medical center. Um, so that, I think that's a real problem. And I think that 
that rural approaches um, may be very different to COVID. And one may be that, um, you know, there, there may be needs to be monitoring early on of symptoms and some call for, you know, quicker intervention. I know one of the things we've all been reading about um, regarding hospitalization of COVID in young and older folks is that a lot of times the folks that ended up um, having to go on uh, ventilators came into the hospital in real distress. Right. They and, and didn't know, that's the important, didn't realize how poorly, um, uh, you know, uh, their ability to, to get oxygen in was. Their pulse oximeters, their, their, their oxygen saturation was in the 60s and 70s, you know, and you, we're, we're supposed to be hanging out at 99 or 100 at all times. Right. So, so in a rural situation, you would really want to make sure you, you'd want to, that you get people in much earlier, at least to get tested and to be seen, then you, you need to, you know, in a, in a more dense, where there's a lot more access density. Of course. And I think, uh, I mean, uh, several states are making approaches to either bring in health professionals who would not be practicing otherwise in their states and they uh, ease restrictions of uh, physicians being able to work across state lines and especially right. with um, the uh, use of telehealth expanding um, under certain emergency orders. Right. Um, I personally have uh, been experiencing um, the use of telehealth um, and being able to make phone calls um, both on the research end, especially um, where you kind of um, have to work through things that the public may not know, like IRB requirements and whatnot. Right. And uh, even for us, um, it, that was still a process. Um, it was actually, it took several weeks. And um, and this is apart from the COVID work that um, our, the organizations that I'm at um, are doing as well. So I think it's kind of been a, it, it's been an interesting situation, especially with testing. Um, a, lot, a lot of people have asked me, you know, um, what what type of tests are out there? Um, what what exists? Um, that whole notion of oh, I can go get a test. Um, really, even still to, till today, um, both uh, students at the school that I I know and just people in the community, uh, I still feel that there's this strong misperception of being able to be tested. And I think it, it kind of brings me to my next point of uh, personal protective equipment, which we've obviously seen has been a big issue and still an issue today um and the the particularly the, the use of gloves and masks um the the use of gloves and masks i'm not sure people really understand still of what you know when to use it and when to use it appropriately um we from stores and uh places you know having their own requirements versus what their county or state governments may be saying I'm curious if there was a, a mistake in how we communicated that or what should we have done better, at least on the public health uh, media or strategy side to work in communities? Yeah, it, that's, you know, it's a great question. And I think we really did fail in our communication um, around mask wearing. So I think the one important piece of communication for everybody is hand washing vigilance and this this kind of discuss is leads into thinking about when to wear gloves and when not to wear gloves right, right. so hand washing vigilance if you that you should wash your hands as frequently as you can 20 seconds sing that abc or happy birthday song and get a lot of soap on lather up but probably the most important thing we can do period to stop this disease okay because um, you know, there have been some studies about um, air droplets and how far they can go. And yes, right. there are times that if you're a big person and you do a big sneeze, <laughs> you may end up getting past that, you know, six foot diam or six foot radius, I should say. The right. other thing I, somebody even said, well, if you're surfing in a humid day, this is a California thing, right? <laughs> surfing in a humid day next to a surfer that has COVID. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what surfers having COVID, you know, that it's possible that the spray and the wind and the humidity could pick up those droplets 
and move them further than six feet? Yes, I'm sure they can. But we're really talking still in public health about probabilities, right? Right. Probability of surfing what's next to someone who has COVID on that human day with on that human day with that wind is low. Yeah, exactly. Probability of, you know, of taking mass transportation or of waiting online to get tested. You know, one of the things that really bothered me. And I love New York. They're my home. They're my people. But one of the things that bothered me a lot um, was seeing early on people standing online for COVID testing, not six feet apart, but sort of scrunched up in crowds. And I, I said to my husband, well, If anybody on that line doesn't have COVID, you know, they're likely to get COVID just on that. And so that's the that's the scenario that you want to mask, right? Right. And you be washing your hands. Um, If you wear gloves, just remember that all gloves do are protect your hands from whatever you're touching, but it doesn't protect anybody else from whatever's on your gloves, right? Of course. So I use gloves to go to the supermarket and I use a mask. Um, so, because that's what the governor says. The governor says we should be doing masks and gloves, at least masks, so I do that. I go, I, so I only put my gloves on after I'm out of the car, mask is on, put the gloves on, okay? you know, walk, take a cart that's been cleaned because now they clean the carts. Although doesn't that, don't you ever ask the question, why didn't they clean the carts for this? Right. Yeah. For years they've had those uh, sanitizing stands. That's right. right. 60,000 people died of the flu last year. Right. It was a bad season. So um, anyway, um, and then I pick up whatever I need to pick up. And I put it in the card and then they take it and they're doing their own bags now, right? You don't can't bring your own recyclable bags. I take my bags, I put them in the car with my gloves, okay? I take my gloves off. And if they need to be washed, I put them in a plastic bag and throw them in the um, you know, a washing machine, or if I've got disposable, I throw them away, okay? Because what I don't want to happen is get in the car, grab my steering wheel, right, that I've just been touching everything on, uh, grab my cell phone, I'm done, right? And now I have my cell phone. So I, 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 you know, get rid of that. I get home, okay? And I know this is silly. It's not silly. This is what I think I do and a lot of other people do. I get a new pair of gloves, Right. And I take my stuff, anything that can be um, stored in a garage setting is stays there for at least 48 hours, right? Just want everything to kind of calm down and die. Um, and then anything I'm bringing in the house, I'm wiping off. Then, and remember, anything you've touched with those gloves, you've got to just, you know, clean off, cleaning surfaces, get rid of my gloves. I was in a UPS store the other day and they were, you know, I was getting something done and, uh, and the woman was just absolutely lovely. And she did, she did not have gloves on her hands, which is fine. And she goes and she takes her hand and she just pushes her mask up. Okay. It's like the worst thing you could do, right? Because people don't understand. So I think we're using masks because I think there was an overwhelming majority of people in the country that said, well, better safe than sorry, we're using masks. I think the evidence to use a mask is less, but we're going to go with it. We're going to use a mask. It can't hurt. But to your point, it can hurt if you're using your mask wrong, if you're laying. And when I was teaching in class, people would have masks and then they take them off and they put them on the desk you know, face down. So whatever was on the mask then ends up at the desk. Sometimes they'd fall, then they'd pick them up. And all of that is bad, you know, hand washing and mask using and glove using, you know, those are faux pas, bad. So in a way it's like, why don't we just stick to washing our hands (laughs) as frequently as possible with lots of soap? So you just heard my spiel on masks and gloves. No, I I, I wish it was, you know, communicated that simply like, you know, just uh, 
not, you know, obviously highlight the urgency to use them, but also just the simplicity in our everyday actions, like grocery shopping, coming in and out of the home and whatnot. Um, it's definitely something a lot of people have asked me. I'm sure you've also seen it yourself. So thanks yeah. for sharing that. And, you know, I think uh, going forward, um, not just with this current pandemic, um, I think what I'm really concerned about as a healthcare professional, as a, as a student, um, and just somebody who really cares about the community and public health, R yes, right now there's a significant public interest in the healthcare system, in public health. I think it'll be a big issue um, politically, but apart from the politics of it, my fear is actually public health remains somewhat independent of politics, Democrat, Republican, however you are. Um, Right now, with this surge of interest, I know students are definitely interested, and I think it'll be a major area where students decide to pursue education on, on many levels. My fear, though, is that as we are opening things up and things do start to normalize to some degree, my fear is that there will be another issue that possibly comes up, whether it's the economy or unrest in some other area that takes away from us. And we kind of don't focus on the issues that uh, really made this pandemic as big as big as it is here in the states. And when uh, my colleagues ask me or friends ask me, like, "Hey, how are we going to keep people involved in this?" And obviously, my response is like, "Well, you know, we can keep having informed conversations like this, and you know, obviously, there's political um, interventions that you're going to pursue. But I also think it's just." keeping that conversation active and especially for young people, I'm curious and, you know, how to keep them engaged, make them, you know, not only just focus on, you know, uh, a pandemic necessarily, but just being involved in healthcare, improving our healthcare system. I think what would be your message on that though? Well, I think that um, there's tens of all of this, hundreds of thousands of, of students, right, of right. school age students uh, sitting home watching CNN or Fox News or whatever people are watching. Um, and they're seeing the importance of public health and some of the disciplines in public health, the modeling and the epidemiologists and the, and the health educators. And I'm hoping that people are actually sitting there, one, saying, Oh, so that's what public health does. And right. two, you know, I want to do that. Um, and so I think we're going to see a resurgence of public health. I think um, we're going to see a resurgence in terms of students deciding this is really what they want to do. And right. that's going to be supported by parents. My mother recently said to me, I saw an epidemiologist on television. This was, of course, within the COVID-19 time. She said, now I know what you do. And of course, I felt terrible <laughs> for all these years. She did not know what I did. She said, I think you have something to do with health but I, and people, but I just, I just guess I didn't think about disease. And I said, oh, mom, mom, <laughs> all I've ever done is disease, right? right? So I think that, you know, parents influence us in a lot of ways. And so I do think, yay for public health, that we're actually going to we're, we're going to get all these bright students and we're going to take them away from chemistry and we're going to move them into public health. And I'm really excited about that. And at the same time, we know we leadership in public health has a mission um, and we are not going to lose that mission. And that's to change up the curriculum so that we right. are prepared so that this doesn't happen again. You know, part of that is leadership and advocacy. We cannot afford to close down surveillance systems that surveil, you know, diseases coming from, you know, zoonotic diseases. We can, from animals, we can't afford to do that. And we have to, you know, we have to, all of us, advocacy and having a voice. This, this, um, this pandemic, demonstrates like multiple things. One is about making sure that we know every time a disease has jumped from an animal to a human. Right. Two, it showed us how bad 
lack of preparedness can be. We could have we could have started preparing in January. Even right, that absolutely. would have been better, right? Yeah. But we didn't. Okay, and so and unfortunately, you know. New York, the greatest city on earth. I mean, I'm a New Yorker. Got <laughs> killed. It's grim. It's still grim there. It's right. terrible. Um, so it showed us that we can't ever let our guard down. We must always be prepared. The third thing it showed us and or demonstrated is, you know, is is that race ethnic disparities are huge in this country and haven't gotten any better. The unveiling, the rolling out of COVID-19, an infectious disease, as a, as a disease, you know, seeped in social determinants and disparities. You know, I, I, I'm outraged by that. I'm outraged that Absolutely. we in this day and age could allow ourselves in our country to actually... Um, you know, to have these disproportionate, uh, you know, morbidity and mortality, these deaths associated with that means we have not done a good enough job in public health, in medicine, in, in public policy, in government, in our communities. And so we, we can't, we really can't forget that either. And then of the course. last thing is that Chronic disease and infectious disease, you don't make choices, okay? Yeah. Because here's the time, we're not, this is not the first time. TB, HIV, HIV is a chronic disease now, but yeah. TB, HIV, and now COVID 19, influenza, it's both a chronic and infectious disease. Our responsibility is to get to understand that concept better in public health and design strategies and research so that we can really get control of that. Of course. And I think you make, a, especially when you tie in uh, medicine, I think so often it is, uh, you would assume naturally that public health and medicine would work kind of hand in hand. Um, and in fact, they've kind of somewhat, you know, worked against each other. And I'm hoping now with, after experiencing this on a national level here in the States um, and also globally, you're going to see more of a resurgence and push toward integrating public health and medicine. And I think that, you know, that play a huge role in improving our overall healthcare system. And I think it, it brings me to my uh, last point here for, you know, just going forward. I think that, you know, I, we've seen things change week by week, if not day by day. But I think, you know, especially in the major hotspots like New York, we're finally starting to see some semblance, you know, with the cases uh, dropping, number of hospitalizations, people on ventilators. Um, I, I know uh, later this week, actually, the uh, the Mercy Hospital, uh, the Navy Mer uh, Mer Mercy ship, We'll be leaving New York Harbor, and you know that was a big move, uh, both in California and New York when uh, they showed up. Um, so, while it's definitely great to see, I think what is the ultimate kind of message for the public right now in terms of you know patients to reopen or um, kind of returning to day to day life, uh, going out to see your friends, or um, being able to maybe even go back to work for those who are uh, you know wanting to do that. So. Yeah. So what, yeah. What's my message? Yeah. <laughs> I think my message is vigilance. We have to be vigilant. Um, you know, the serial surveillance studies, which are the antibody studies, um, you know, do not indicate that a large proportion of, of the population has actually um, has actually gotten uh, COVID-19, which means that Somewhere, if you look at the UCLA numbers, at the San Francisco numbers, somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of the population are still extremely vulnerable to, to, to COVID. Um, we also don't know that much about immunity, so it's not clear. It's looking a little bit like this is going to be more of a, uh, a yearly, an annual event. So, so we're going to really have to take hygiene and vigilance to another another level um and i don't think we can allow ourselves to to become complacent if we want the rewards of uh loosening some of our social policies then we have to be as individuals and as communities you know more responsible about 
our behaviors because our behaviors and transmission go hand in hand. Of course. Yeah, I think, um, I, I think you know, just constantly emphasizing that, you know, I, the other point I like to always kind of mention when I'm talking to friends and family is, you know, uh, the notion on TV or um, what we hear of things overnight happening or within several hours that we would see in a, a scientific show or medical show, that's not the reality. And, you know, science requires patience. Medicine requires patience. Um, there's trial and error. Uh, you know, I've heard things like, oh, is there going to be a vaccine by the end of the year or are we going to have a cure ready by the end of the year? I'm like, think of any major disease that we now kind of have a cure vaccine from. Like those took years, if not decades. And while I'm not saying that about this, but it'll definitely take time with clinical trials, um, uh, processes, to even get these studies approved and recruiting patients. Um, there's still, you know, there's always stigma against uh, medical research and scientific research. So all we can do is kind of be hopeful, uh, constantly being vi vigilant and advocating, um, you know, for better public health. And I think that's a, that's a great way to approach the future of this and hopefully also kind of bring this to a close and just be prepared for the next time. So with that, I definitely want to thank you for uh, being on the show today and answering some of my questions and providing this information to everyone. So thank you for being here and uh, hopefully we'll have you back for uh, a different issue of sorts next time. That'd be great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing this. You made great points. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for joining this episode of Global Talks by Pav Life with Pav and Lohia. Make sure to visit pavlife.com where you can also subscribe to the podcast and read the Pav Life blog for perspectives and news on everything healthcare you simply can't get anywhere else. Share your thoughts on the show by rating the show and by connecting with us on social media. Thanks for tuning in. See you in the next episode.